Thank you, Christina. In your bulletins, there's a sermon note-taking sheet. I want to encourage you to take that out and uh, take some notes to help you uh, uh, learn more, to remember more, if you would please. <clears throat> it is said that when Cortez got to the New World in 1519, that he burned his ships so that his men would be well motivated. Now, why did he have to do that? Well, he needed all of his men to be motivated to work hard if they were going to succeed in the new world. But he also knew that hard times were coming, and some of his men would rally to the challenge and get the work done, but others, when hard times came, would uh, be discouraged, they'd get tired, and they would want to go back to the new world. Well, if he burned his ships, everybody would have to be motivated to make it work because there was no way to go back to the new world. Well, Peter faced a similar situation in New Testament times. Life was hard for Christians. They were being persecuted. They were being excluded from their families. And Peter knew that all of the Christians needed to stay together. They needed to rally together to get Jesus' work done. But only part of the people were strong and were wanting to remain faithful to Jesus to get the work done. Other people were uh, being discouraged. Other people were tempted to go back to their old life. And that would not get the job done of getting the gospel to the world. So Peter wrote a letter to the Christians in the part of the empire that were being persecuted to try to encourage them. He had a similar message that Cortez had when he told his troops he was going to burn the ships. Now here's where we're going this morning. It is hard as Christians to remain faithful. Can we all agree on that? Almost every area of life is, a, uh, is somehow uh, stacked against us so that it's really hard to remain faithful. Uh, it's really hard to get the job done that God wants us to do. It's easy just to give up and be like everybody else. Can I say that again? Isn't it easy just to give up in these tough times and be like everybody else? Where what Peter told us that we're going to look at in today's sermon, what he told us can provide motivation for us to stay faithful to Jesus, for us to keep doing the work that he wants us to do uh, because Jesus is coming. What I want us to look at today is a continuation of the ministry of the Holy Spirit whom uh, we have been studying. Okay, my always question, how are we doing temperature-wise? Those of you that are normal, that, that are wired normally, how some of you are always cold, some are always hot. 45. Boy, that's a real big help. <laughs> okay. Uh, trouble if it's too hot, they'll go to sleep. <laughs> okay. Why don't you maybe... Uh, why don't you maybe uh, kind of nudge that maybe down a degree? Today's passage, 1 Peter 4, verses 7 through 11. If you're using a pew Bible, the page number is up on the screen. 1 Peter 4, verses 7 through 11. This is Peter's motivation to the Christians who were struggling. The end of all things is near. Therefore... Be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks... He should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides 
so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter in these verses tells us something really important. We are all in the same boat because the end of all things is near. That means the end of all things is imminent. That means that Jesus is coming. As I shared with the children, God has the day for Jesus to return on the calendar. And it is coming. And the Bible tells us that those of us who are Christians, when Jesus comes, we're going to be caught up into the clouds with other believers and we'll meet Jesus and then we'll head on to heaven. People who are not Christians will be left behind. What does that phrase bring up in your mind? They will be left behind. Now that puts us all in the same boat because we have to determine whether we will be caught up into the clouds or not. That also puts us in the same boat because we have to determine whether those that we love will be caught up into the clouds or not. I remember one night I had a real nightmare. I dreamed that Jesus came. And somehow as I was going up into the clouds, I could look back and I could see my loved ones that were left behind. I considered that a nightmare. Uh, we're all in the same boat because we need to determine our destiny and we need to determine the destiny of those that we love. We face a problem that Cortez did not face. When he told his men that he was burning the ships, there was plenty of evidence. Uh, they could see the fire. They could see the smoke. They knew for sure that the boats had been burned and that they needed to get with it. The trouble is, it's hard for us to believe that Jesus is really coming. Uh, it's hard for us to see the evidence of it. Can we be honest with one another? Do you live daily with the motivation that Jesus could come that day or the next? I would have to say most of us are, no. We know up here that he's coming, but we have somehow lost the motivation that it could be tomorrow, that it could be next week. So uh, Peter gives us some proof. Uh, many people doubt that Jesus is coming. And so Peter gave his people proof, and he gives us proof uh, that can motivate us to remember that Jesus is coming. Uh, his proof is found in 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 10. Uh, this may be the last book that was written of the Old Testament. We're not sure. Uh, exactly when Peter died. There are legends, but they're not proven in Scripture. So here Peter obviously is writing to people that are struggling with being motivated that Jesus is coming and it's going to impact them. So look at the proof that he gives. First of all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they, did, but they deliberately forget that long ago by God's words, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction by ungodly men. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. 
and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Do you see the proof that Peter gave? He said that there were doubters, there were scoffers in his day. Uh, and here's what they said. They said, you know, Christians have been saying for a long time that Jesus has, is going to come. Well, that's true today. Uh, it's been over 2,000 years since Jesus said he was going to come. So it is true. We've been saying it for a long time. And then Peter said some scoffers were saying, well, it hadn't happened yet. And so what were they implying? They were implying it's not going to happen. And so they were doubting it, they weren't living like it, uh, and they were just going on with their lives. So what proof does Peter give? What proof that we can look at? What proof can we remember that will prove to us that it is going to happen? Well, the proof is God's word. God has said it. Therefore, it's true. And Peter gives us some history about God's Word. In the beginning, when nothing was created, what did God say? God said, let there be creation. And what happened? It happened. The Bible said, let there be light, let there be animals, all the rest of that. And it happened. And then God said, let there be a flood. And what happened? There was a flood. Uh, Peter could have gone all through the Bible and said, God said this and it happened. God said this and it happened. And so his point is, God says he's coming and he is. The proof is in the past. What God has said has come true. Didn't God say he would forgive you if you gave your life to Jesus? What happened? He did. Uh, and when you backslide, God says, if you confess your sins, he'll forgive you. Did he? Sure he did. You have all kinds of evidence. God said it. It happened. So God says Jesus is coming. Therefore, he is. Now, we need to go back to, uh, oh, 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 oh. Why does God want us to know that Jesus is coming? Why is that important enough to bring it up? Why does he want us to know? Because he wants us to get ready. Because when Jesus comes, certain permanent changes are going to take place. And you need to be ready for those permanent changes. Because if you're not, you won't have an opportunity to change them. So God doesn't want to surprise anybody. He wants us to know what's going to happen, what we need to do to get ready to happen. So God tells us so that we will be ready, particularly so that we can repent. We can change directions. We can change what we're doing. Rather than not get ready, we'll get ready. Rather than resisting Jesus, we will cooperate with him. Okay, now, back in 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11, Peter gives us four things that we need to be doing to get ready. Okay? Are you ready? I mean, Peter's just downright honest. Here's what we need to do to get ready. Number one, Peter says, we need to pray. Did you hear that? We need to pray. Why? Because there are a lot of things that need to change. There are a lot of people that need to get ready, and we need the power of prayer for it to happen. We can't do it without the power of prayer. Remember what Max Locato says? When we work, we work. But when we pray, when we pray, God works. And that's what we need to have happen. We all have loved ones that are just being really stubborn. We need God to work in their lives, so we need to pray. We have things in our life, like we saw this morning in Sunday school, that stubborn sin that just gets in the way. We need to pray so that God will work. Okay, I need your help this morning, okay? I thought, well, what's going to keep them awake? You know, I mean, we've helped the food pantry, been a long, hard week, something like that. So I need your help. Okay, we're going to list the four things that we need to be doing. We're going to do it as a group. Now, I'm not going to make you stand up and get in the middle. Okay, you can, you can stay where you are, but only if you cooperate. 
Okay, don't make me come down there. Okay. Therefore, say it with me. Pray so that God will work. Oh, come on. Even without my hearing aids, I can hear that with pitiful. Okay. Pray so God will work. All right. Number two. The second thing we need to do, Peter says that we need to love each other deeply. We need to love each other deeply. This is agape love. This is not emotional love. And it means that we need to do what's best for each other. We need to love deeply. We need to love each other deeply and do what's best for the other person. You don't do what you feel like doing to each other. You do what's best for the other person. Now, why is that important? Can I be honest with you? I'm not a perfect pastor. Did you know that? There are things that I can do that will hurt your feelings. I don't intend to do them, but I do them. And you're not perfect either. There are things you do to hurt my feelings. Can you imagine that? And there are things you do to hurt each other. So what can happen when we hurt each other? We can divide, we can separate, and that hinders what God wants to do. So therefore, we need, we need to do the best we can to love each other so our imperfection does not become a problem. We are going to hurt each other. We need to love each other so we won't hinder the work that needs to be done. Does that make sense to you? Wouldn't it be a shame if one of your loved ones was lost because you became bitter over what church, some church member did? Wouldn't it be terrible if our church broke into a fight because we had hurt feelings and lost people came and wouldn't go back to a church? Well, that's not worth it. We don't need to hinder the work of God, so we need to love each other. Okay, are you ready to go? Number one, pray so God will work. Number two, love so we won't hinder his work. All right, you guys are catching on really well. I know you were afraid I'd, uh, I would cancel the potluck. Okay. You, you <laughs> okay, number three, he says we need to help others. He says we need to practice hospitality. What that means is back in Peter's day, people traveled during the Lord's work, but there were no motels. So where were they going to stay? Who was going to feed them? God's people would. And so Peter says you need to practice hospitality. You need to help other people who are doing the Lord's work. Uh, well, that's what we need to do. Uh, we have people who are away from home doing the Lord's work. And so we need to find ways to help them. From time to time, people come through Omaha during the Lord's work, and they need a place to stay. We can open our homes. We have people around the world that are doing God's work. Well, we need to open our wallets to help them. By the way, this church does an awesome job with the mission offerings. I think you have caught the vision of how to help the Lord's work around the world. Uh, we're doing a study of, uh, of our church history, and Rose is kind of helping us. You know, Rose, in those early years, our mission giving was pitiful, wasn't it? I, it was just pitiful. But in recent years, God has moved in our hearts, and we are really generous. We always go over our goal, many times by more than 10%. So we're doing a good job. Okay, are you ready? Therefore... Pray so God will work. Love so we won't hinder His work. Give to support God's work. Now, number four. This is something that has to do with the Holy Spirit. This is how the Holy Spirit can help us to get ready. Number four. We need to serve. We need to do our part. 
The Bible says that we are to use the gifts that we received from the Holy Spirit. Each one of us has a gift that we can use in order to do the Lord's work. Now, I want you to look at Romans 12, 4 through 8. Paul picks up the same thing as he's writing to the people in Rome. And he uses a really good illustration, a really uh, uh, good illustration that points out how this works, why it's important for each of us to use our gifts. Romans 12, verses 4 through 8. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all of the rest. We all have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Just as we have seen that the Holy Spirit blesses us, remember over the past weeks we've been looking at how the Holy Spirit blesses us, so the Holy Spirit has given us gifts so that we can be a blessing to each other, so that we can be a blessing to our church. Now, Peter gives us a word picture. Here it is. In the human body, there are all kinds of members, all kinds of parts, and each part has a different function. Uh, each, each part of the body contributes to the good of the body, and uh, our bodies work better when we have all of the parts, when all of the parts are doing their job. Now, many of you know that 11 years ago this August, I lost a part of my body. I lost the end of my ring finger on my right hand. Do you think I ever miss it? I mean, it's just a little part. It is. You know, I like to work on my car. Sometimes I have to reach in with my right hand and guess what's missing? the last inch of that finger. So I have to use the other hand and, and try to get it. You know, I know, and many of you do too, you have parts of the body that don't work just right. When they don't work, you miss them. You need every single part. And that's what Paul is saying. All of you are members of the body of Christ here, and he needs all of you to do your part. And so the Bible says, that all of you have a job to do and you have the ability to do it. All of you have a job to do around here and the ability to do it. There's a great book by Buckingham and Clifton. It's called Discovering Your Strengths. And they talk about everybody, if they're going to really contribute to their family, contribute to a church, they need to do what they do best. They need to do their strength. And they say part of the problem is people say, well, let somebody else do it. And so they did some research. Can other people do what you are gifted to do? Now, they can attempt to do, but here's what they found out. Only one in 10,000 people have your strength. Did you know that? Only one in 10,000 people have your strength. Now, other people have some strength, and they can do a little bit about what you're supposed to do, but they can't do it your way. Boy, that's really important for our church. Do we have 10,000 people here? So guess how many of yous we have? We have only one. And so if you say... I'm busy, I'm distracted. Let somebody else do what I'm supposed to do. And God says, it's not going to happen. You're the only you that I have. Now, somebody else can step up and do part of what you do, but nobody will be like you. Some of you are thankful you have only one of me in the church. I know what you're thinking. You know, if we were 10,001, we may have two of you. But we're thankful we have only one. 
Boy, you know, that's really eye-opening, isn't it? Because we hear a lot in our church, let somebody else do it. Well, if you have the strength to do it, you're the only one who can do it like you. Wow, what an eye-opening statistic. One in 10,000 people can do what you can do. Okay, therefore, pray so God will work. Love so we won't hinder his work. Give to support God's work and use our gifts to do God's work. Let me take just a couple of seconds here and share with you the seven gifts that Paul lists. Uh, there are more gifts than these that are listed in the New Testament. Uh, but here are seven that he lists. And uh, I think the reason why he lists them is so we'll say, hey, is that my strength? Uh, am I the one in 10,000 that can do that? So here's the list very quickly. Uh, they're the last part of your sermon notes there. Number one, prophecy is preaching God's word. Then you've got teaching, which is teaching God's Word. He also mentions service. This is practical stuff. For example, Melody needs help with the nursery. Maybe you have that gift. We need ushers. You may have that gift. We need people to mow the lawn. Uh, you may have that gift. People help with the food pantry. We need people to use that gift. This is practical stuff that needs to be done if our church is to be what it's supposed to do. Okay, and notice, it is a legitimate gift, just as important as preaching, just as important as teaching, doing the practical stuff. And then, and then this one is obvious, encouraging people. We have people in our church that are encouragers, and sometimes they will call me. Can I pray for you? Can I encourage you? I know this is a tough time. Uh, and then giving generously, uh, one reason why we meet our budget all of the time, while mission offerings are great, while the benevolence offering last week was great, is we have people with this gift. They're able to give generously. Uh, and then we have some of these people in our church too. They know how to lead. They know how to organize, do administration, and they get stuff done. And then the last one is the gift of mercy, helping those in need. When people are hurting, they know how to help. They know what to do. They, uh, they have that gift. Let me close with a thought I hope will motivate you uh, to serve the way that you should, uh, to pray the way that you should, to help our church be all that we can in helping people. Uh, I want you to imagine that a young couple is expecting their first baby any time now. I want you to imagine a young couple is expecting their baby any time. I can remember back to those days. How many years ago was it, Deb? In 79? That's a long time ago. Okay, okay. Now, in a perfect world, the husband wanted to drive his wife to the hospital in that car. Man, you know, load her in that Camaro, take her to the hospital. But the husband realizes he does not live in a perfect world. He does not have that kind of car. Instead, he's got an old clunker. You know, he is going to have to get his wife to the hospital in that car. So what does he do? He says, I've got to fix this clunker up. If she's going to get to the hospital, it's going to be in that car. So he changes the oil, he changes the antifreeze, he airs up the tires, he puts his best shine to it as he can, because he knows the day is coming when they're going to have to go to the hospital, and that is their way. Jesus is coming, and we need to get ready. We need to get our loved ones ready. Now, in the world of our dreams, we hope a new Billy Graham will arise and win of our loved ones to Jesus. Or that someone will, will invent a phone app. You can give it to your loved one. That'll lead them to Jesus. You know, in our dream world, somebody else will do it. But in the real world, God is going to use this clunker of a church.
to get people ready. Can we say that? Our church isn't perfect. There are things wrong here. Your pastor's a clunker. You're a clunker. Did I really say that? But what is going to get your loved ones ready to go to heaven? This clunker. So what do we need to do? Each one of us needs to do the best we can to get this church in shape so that we can get the job done. Jesus is coming. He is going to use us. We need to do all we can to get this clunker to get people to Jesus. Judy, I was thrilled. You know, our Bible school was a clunker this year. But we reached nine kids for Jesus. Wow, God does well with clunkers. One last thing. I know you're busy. Busyness is just a way of life. And the thing that our church is finding and other churches are finding is a lot of people are too busy to serve. And we are finding fewer people to do the work than ever before. That's not going to get the job done. I know you're busy, but think of it this way. Some of the things that you are doing are important, and you need to keep doing them. There's no doubt about it. I'm not asking you, I'm not asking you to quit your jobs. You know, quit taking care of your family. But there are some things that you're busy with that are not as important as getting people to heaven when Jesus comes. And so I'd like for you to look at your calendar, look at your schedule, and look at some of the things that you're doing that are fun, they are important. But you look at them and say, that's not as important as doing what God needs me to do to get people ready. So I want to encourage you to realize Jesus is coming. We need to get ready. So here's what I'm inviting you to do. Number one, remember that Jesus is coming. It is the motivation that we need to get this clunker ready for people to go. Number two, you make certain that you are ready for Jesus to come. The Bible says he comes like a thief. You won't know when he comes. You won't have time to be ready. So you need to be ready. Make certain, as the kids said this morning, you've invited Jesus into your life. He's your Savior. He's the Lord of your life. Make certain you're ready. And then help other people to get ready. Because you won't have time to get them ready once Jesus comes. Help other people to get ready. What if they're not listening? And you pray, pray, pray. We found that uh, with, our, with our oldest daughter. God answers prayer. And then, of course, find your place to serve. That one in 10,000 strength that you have is something that you can put to work. Hey, stand with me. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are all in the same boat. Jesus is coming. And we all struggle with that. We, we, it's really easy for us just to give up his work and do something else. Give up growing and do something else. So we thank you for this reminder because when he comes and we're ready, it's going to be glorious. So I pray that you can be with us. Uh, if we have not really given our lives to Jesus, help us to do that today. Father, if we've just kind of given up trying to reach our loved ones, help us to pray, pray, pray. Find an opportunity to witness to them. Father, I know Ted is on vacation, uh, and I know he wants to witness to his mom, and I pray that that can go well. And Father, many of us need to do the same thing. And Father, as uh, there are things that need to be done in our church and in other churches, Help all of us who know you to do what we can uh, so our churches can be strong, they can be unified, they can work in your power to get your work done. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.